Hello and welcome to Let's Talk About the Middle East. I'm Juliana Musheyev and my co-host Andy Blanche will not be joining us today because of the many other projects that she undertakes to make the world a better place and they are filling up her schedule. On this show, we talk about the Middle East, its culture, politics, religion, history, just about anything that captures the complexity of the region. We hope to promote an open and honest discussion about the conflict in Israel and Palestine and to humanize the conflict by getting to know people who have a stake in the issues. You're listening to WSLR 96.5 LPFM Sarasota and WBPV 100.1 LPFM in Bradenton. The opinions and views expressed on Let's Talk About the Middle East are strictly those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect those of the station manager, the board of directors, or anyone else affiliated with WSLR. On today's show, I want to tell a story, which, like many stories today, has two completely different sides. It is the story of Dr. Afia Siddiqui. Dr. Siddiqui is the mother of three children, the daughter of an educated Muslim family, and a Pakistani neuroscientist who graduated from MIT. In March of 2003, Dr. Siddiqui and her three children were kidnapped by unknown authorities in Karachi, Pakistan. Later that month, she was turned over to representatives of the United States. Dr. Afia was arrested because she was suspected to have ties to al-Qaeda. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, alleged chief planner of the 9-11 attacks, was alleged to be Afia's second husband's uncle. He had reportedly mentioned her name while he was being interrogated, and shortly thereafter, she was added to the FBI's war on terrorism list. From the time of her abduction in 2003, five years went by with no communication about or from Dr. Siddiqui, so her family believed her to be dead. She finally resurfaced in 2008 in Afghanistan. Still, little was known about how she mysteriously ended up there, where her kids were, and what happened in the five years that she was missing. After she showed up in Afghanistan, the Afghan police arrested her, claiming that she was carrying documents that contained instructions on how to make conventional bombs, descriptions of New York City landmarks, and references to a mass casualty attack. The day after her arrest, Afia Siddiqui was shot and severely wounded at the police compound. Her American interrogators claimed that she had gotten a hold of a rifle and started shooting at them. She was flown to the United States, where she was sentenced to 86 years in prison for attempted murder. Dr. Afia remains imprisoned, now at the notorious Federal Medical Center in Carswell, Fort Worth, Texas, where she is kept in a special housing unit, which is the most severe confinement category. Her life is under constant threat. One side of this story alleges that Afia Siddiqui is a criminal, one of the FBI's seven most wanted terrorists, and the most dangerous woman in the world. This is the story told by the United States government and the mainstream media. The other side of the story, however, suggests that Dr. Afia Siddiqui was wrongfully imprisoned and subjected to cruel and torturous circumstances, despite forensic and physical evidence that, con that contradicts the ruling. This is the story being revealed by her family, activists all over the world, legal observers, and several international human rights organizations. After Afia's arrest in 2008, the mystery surrounding the five years that she was missing before she turned up in Afghanistan slowly began unfolding. Evidence had emerged that Afia had been illegally imprisoned and tortured at Bagram Prison in Afghanistan, a secret detention center notorious for prisoner abuse. Meanwhile, there was no evidence of Afia having any ties to terrorist activity. When she was arrested in Afghanistan, she had been released from Bagram. She had just been released from Bagram, and she was fragile and disoriented. 
The FBI seeking information alert, which led to Afia's abduction from Pakistan in 2003 and subsequent imprisonment in Bagram, stated, quote, Although the FBI has no information indicating this individual is connected to specific terrorist activities, the FBI would like to locate and question this individual. Witnesses from Bagram Prison told of seeing this haunting symbol of a war on terror gone mad. In 2008, Afia was charged with assaulting a US, U.S. officials with their own rifles. However, no one who was physically present at the scene has filed any sworn statement as to what actually happened, and no U.S. personnel were hurt during the incident. In fact, Dr. Afia was the only one who had sustained severe injuries, including brain damage. According to several legal observers, the trial of Dr. Afia was littered with many inconsistencies and defects, chief among them being many rulings by the judge that strongly favored the prosecution and prejudiced the case against the defense. These ranged from allowing hearsay evidence and jury instructions that favored the prosecution. As a result of the preceding judge's framing of the case in a negative light, Dr. Afia was convicted despite all physical and forensic evidence that showed that she could not have committed the acts that she was charged with. Despite her wrongful imprisonment, Afia Siddiqui told the judge in her trial, quote, I will not forget what you have done to me, but I will forgive you. Siddiqui has been embraced by the Muslim world as the daughter of the Ummah, meaning community, and several activists and international human rights organizations have come out in support of her, claiming that Siddiqui was not an extremist and that she and her young children were illegally detained, interrogated, and tortured by Pakistani intelligence, U.S. authorities, or both, during her five-year disappearance. There has been an international outrage as ev evidence has been piling up of the illegal detainees in Bagram and other secret detention centers. This matter has become a major public issue and has support across Pakistani political and social spectrums. And as a result, the Pakistani government has formally made the request to the U.S. government for Siddiqui's release. Currently, Afia is still imprisoned in Texas. She is not able to communicate with the outside world, so little is known about the condition she is in, but it is believed to be severe. I knew nothing of Afia Siddiqui until around this time last Saturday, March 19th. I was in Washington, D.C. for the first time in my life to attend a protest in support of Palestine that Sunday. On this cold and rainy morning, me and a couple of my friends attended a protest in support of Afia with little knowledge of her case and the movement that had been created in her name. There were around seven people standing out in the rain in 30-degree weather, most of them Muslims with signs saying, Free Afia. We were greeted with gratitude and with the words, Salam Aleikum. Shortly after arriving, I asked the director of the Afia Foundation, Maury Salah Khan, if I could ask him a few questions. We're recording. What's your name? My name is Maury, M A U R I, Salakhan, S A A L A K H A N. And I'm Director of Operations for the Afia Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about why we're out here today? Yeah, to, uh, March 2016 marks the 13th year that Dr. Afia Siddiqui has been wrongfully imprisoned. The first five years, she was secretly held overseas, and from 2008 till now, uh, she's been here in the United States. Uh, right now, she's on a military base in Fort Worth, Texas. So we wanted to have four rallies in four different cities in the month of March to mark the 13th year of her uh, imprisonment and to you know, bring more attention and pressure uh, uh, for her release. 
Great. So, uh, what kind of turnout have you been having in these cities? Do people seem to be coming out? Yes, uh, we we had a very good turnout in Boston. We had a, an, an even better turnout in New York City. Um, and today, uh, here in um, Washington D.C., we have uh, we have the kind of weather now that we're supposed to be having this year, which <laughs> which uh, involves uh, uh, you know cool temperatures and and a, a light, very light rain. Hopefully, it won't get any heavier than this. And uh, we're also hoping that this won't discourage folk from coming. But right now, it looks good. People are arriving. I see a couple of more folk coming across the street now. Last question for people who might not know anything about uh, Dr. Okay. Afia, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what do you want them to know about what's happening uh, with this situation? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we want them to know that you know first of all this is a this is a muslim woman who came to the united states full of promise um, hope and expectation um, an enormous amount of of uh, of potential i mean she came here um, well prepared by her her family by her parents um, to do excellent work work in, in, in the field that uh, of her interests. Um, she, when she arrived, she was 18 years old in 1990. She um, spent um, her freshman year at the University of, of Houston, and then she got a full scholarship to MIT. She went off to MIT. She graduated with honors, went from there to Brandeis University, again graduating with honors with a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. Just brilliant. But she was also an activist. Um, she she was someone who um, had a very deep and abiding belief in Islam, and she taught it. Uh, she uh, she exemplified it, and she was also um, around the time of the Bosnia crisis in the 1990s. Uh, she became a, a humanitarian relief activist while still, you know, excelling as a student. And because of her activism, after the tragedy of 9/11, she became a person of suspicion, and that's the suspicion followed her home when she went back to Pakistan in 2002. She was targeted for rendition. This is the most important thing we want people to, to understand. She was targeted for a rendition operation simply because she became a person of suspicion. The U.S. government claimed to have had intelligence, faulty intelligence it turns out, that she had ties to Al-Qaeda. And on the basis of that faulty intelligence, the same type of intelligence Intelligence that was used to prosecute a war against the Iraq based upon weapons of mass destruction that never existed. Uh, she was targeted for rendition. She was disappeared with her children, and um, and then that nightmare that's been going on now for 13 years began. So this is the most important thing. You know, she symbolizes all of the wrong-headed policies and practices that have been implemented in the name of national security and a war on terrorism. She symbolizes all of this. And uh, she's also become probably one of the most well-known, one of the most well-known political prisoners in the world. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. After my interview with Maury Salakan, he instructed protesters, which by this time consisted of 10 to 15 people, to march over to a busier street corner. Passers-by stared at us and took pictures. Several of them stopped and read the story on the informational board set out by the Afia Foundation. We walked and we chanted. Free Afia now! Free Afia now! Free Afia now! What do you want? Justice! What do you want it for? Afia! What do you want? Justice! What do you want it for? Afia! Several people stood in the center of our group to speak, including the man who was leading the chant. He spoke about how a central tenet of the Muslim tradition is that when one person suffers, all of us do. We are all part of the same body.
Another Muslim speaker explained why he continues to fight for Afia. He said that the Muslim community needs to realize that this could have been their mother, their daughter, or their sister. This could have happened to any of them. Perhaps the most meaningful part of the rally is when Maury Salakan read a letter sent to us by Afia's sister. Now, this is the message that was sent by Dr. Fauzia Siddiqui, Afia's sister, to those who have gathered in three cities and who will gather in one more city before this month is out. It is a message of thanks from the family of Afia Siddiqui. She wrote, in its brief history, my country, Pakistan, has endured more than its share of difficult times. But we always maintained our dignity. And because of this, even those with whom we had disagreements respected us. Our dignity evaporated when the dictator of the previous government, referring to Parvez Musharraf, began to sell our brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, sons and daughters, and even our young children to his foreign master. He even brags in his autobiography about how much money he made from this disgraceful practice. The respect from other nations that Pakistan had earned during six decades of struggle vanished overnight. I am ashamed to say that I remained silent when this stain of dishonor began spreading across our land. It was easy. This wasn't my problem. There was nothing I could do about it. Those people must have been doing something bad. Or so I thought. Even when my sister disappeared, I remained silent. I was told she and her children would be returned shortly. As the days passed into weeks and weeks turned into months, I called upon our ministers and leaders, but in vain. I would write letters and email every NGO and human rights advocate I could find. But in summary, I was told that unless I remained silent, my children would not be safe. My mother would not be safe. I would not be safe. In the summer of 2008, I was approached by a group of human rights activists. Their investigation turned up evidence that Afia may be alive and being held at Bagram Prison in Afghanistan, Prisoner 650. In the absence of a meaningful legal forum, they were going to present this evidence at a press conference. My presence would help make our nation aware of the ordeal that my sister and thousands more have endured. I was given a choice. Speak up and risk the lives of my children and my mother. Speak up and risk leaving my mother with another missing daughter. Speak up and risk leaving my own children without a mother. Speak up and risk everything I have and everyone I love on the slim chance that my sister was still alive. After all these years, Afia could not possibly still be alive. This must be some other woman. Should I risk all that I have left for this woman in agony? But there in front of me was a woman, another woman, enduring the worst abuse imaginable. I could not let any other woman go through this without speaking out. I spoke up, and nothing happened to my children, to my mother, to me. But something else did happen. 
Within days, Afi was found wandering the streets of Ghazni. Within days, the dictator fled the country, demonstrating the cowardice of all evil men. Within days, I had custody of Afi's older son. I spoke up, and I made a difference. I will continue to speak up because it is the only way I can help my sister and the thousands of men, women, and children who have vanished during the last decade. I am a doctor. Because of the education that my father and mother provided me and the skills that God gave me, I can heal injury and cure sickness. I have been forced to learn to heal a different sort of injury and cure a different sort of sickness. But I cannot do this alone. And I am grateful to be among so many people who have demonstrated a commitment to fighting injustice in all its guises. The same fear looms over U.S. Muslims in the wave of Islamophobia. I have no words to thank you for rallying at MIT in Boston, at the Federal Building in New York, at the Justice Department in Washington, and outside the military base in, in Texas to bring needed attention to one of the gravest injustices of our time. Nor do I have words to thank the organizers for the efforts that have gone into these initiatives to free Afia, nor to show our gratitude for your bravery in voicing your concern. Indeed, you are the few that make history by raising your voice to help an innocent soul. May Allah put his barakat, his blessings, into all of these mobilizations and grant Afia the freedom she deserves. Through my word, though my words fail me, I know my Allah, my God, will not. And I pray he showers his blessings on you all and reward you immensely. May Allah keep you safe, happy, and successful. Amen. You are listening to WSLR 96.5 LPFM in Sarasota and WBPV 100.1 LPFM in Bradenton. Free tax assistance is available now in Sarasota County. Free tax aid is available at locations throughout Sarasota for quick filing of federal income tax returns for individuals. IRS certified volunteers will be at sites operated through AARP and Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, or VITA. Only residents who earned $62,000 or less last year can use the VITA sites, but there is no income limit for the AARP tax help in Sarasota County. Information is available at www.scgov.net or call United Way at 941-308-4357. And you're listening to Let's Talk About the Middle East. Back to our story of Afia Siddiqui, a Pakistani Muslim woman who was abducted with her children and imprisoned in a secret detention center in Afghanistan for five years. She was subjected to torture and prisoner abuse, despite no evidence of ties to terrorist activity and no trial. She was arrested again in Afghanistan upon her release from Bagram Prison and sentenced to 86 years in prison at Fort Worth, Te- in Fort Worth, Texas on charges of attempted murder for which there was no physical or forensic evidence. I just played a clip of director of the Afia Foundation, Maury Khan, reading a letter from Afia's sister at a protest I attended in Washington, D.C., Another attendee, Aisha Jones, had actually tried to get in contact with Afia Siddiqui. She was not able to because prison authorities were keeping Afia's mail from her. 
Although she was hesitant, Aisha allowed me to interview her about why she had traveled all the way from Richmond, Virginia, to attend the protest. Um, can you tell me your name? Yes, I'm Aisha Jones. Uh, why is it so important for you to be here today? Because we currently have a, uh, a prisoners page on our Facebook account. It's called Don't Forget the Prisoners. And we write, well, me, myself, I write a lot of sisters that's incarcerated. And I've written Afia Siddiqui like three times. And and she never responded and come to find out I've heard that they're holding her mail and they're not giving her her mail um, and I actually got in correspondence with a sister that's incarcerated at the same prison that she's at and I told her to if you could at least give my salams to her ask her why she's not writing and word got back to me that she's not able to talk to her and they really have her section off you know away from everybody She's like in a hole and she can't be around other prisoners. So for people that might not know about this huge problem of their of people being imprisoned unjustly, what would you tell them? What, what do you want them to do about this? Once they hear about it, what would you tell them to do? Um, this really, you know, only thing we can do is things like this, rally and come together um, as one ummah, as all the Muslims come together and just stand up for all the prisoners that's incarcerated. You know, it doesn't take just one, you know. Um, we need to start doing more rallies and start doing more things like this in order to get more Muslims together. Just like the, the brother has said before, I forgot his name, but he said it's a shame that people don't even come out to support somebody that could be your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. And all I can say is that we just need to come together and stand out more and speak out more and, and have more rallies, more protests. You know, that's the only way that we can get to certain people sometimes. You know, sometimes it's hard um, and people like to give up and say, well, I don't want to do this no more, you know, but it shouldn't be like that. You should always keep fighting, you know, because it'll work. It always works. It just takes time. Time, and people need to learn patience, you know. So it's just it's just time. And this, this is my husband. I don't know if you wanted to speak to him. He speaks much better than me. <laughs> so <you're> okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. You love Salah Khan ended on an urgent note stating that we must either put enough pressure on the U.S. government to authorize Afia's release or she will die in prison, becoming a martyr of a tra and a tragic victim of the war on terror. When you have weather like this, conditions like this, and people come out, it dramatizes how serious they are about whatever the issue happens to be. And so again, I feel blessed to be here with those of you who took the time out on this day to raise, help raise your voice with our voice for Afia. Our sister is now 13 years in, and she's not going to last much longer on that base where she's being held. Either one of two things is going to happen. Afia is going to be released soon because of the pressure that we together collectively generate for her release or she's going to die soon on that base where she's being held. She's not going to live on that base for more years to come. It has to be one or the other. After 13 years, against all odds, the supporters of Afia Siddiqui have built a mass movement. Over 100,000 people have now signed the petition urging the U.S. government to repatriate Siddiqui. As stated before, the international pressure generated by this movement led to the formal request for repatriation by the Pakistani government. To find out more about the case of Afia Siddiqui, you can go to freeafia.org or afiamovement.com. That's A A F I A S I D D I Q I. You've been listening to Let's Talk About the Middle East. Uh, if you want to learn more about the show, give us feedback or share ideas. 
Uh, you can look us up on Facebook. Just search Let's Talk About the Middle East. If you leave an interesting comment, we'll give you a shout out at our next show. And you can find our show and others on the podcast site. Our theme music is from Merkava uh, by the Israeli musician and peace activist Gabby Myers.